Um, it, sounds, it sounds like it's a topic that um, piques some interest and we have some people here specifically for this. So without further ado, I am honored to be introducing Dr. Michelle Simisek. And Dr. Michelle Simisek is a full-time faculty member at the University of Arizona Global Campus. Um, prior to working for U UAGC, Dr. Simisek spent 20 years working in public education, K-12 districts in Colorado and Wisconsin. She's taught kindergarten through third grade as a classroom teacher, and then she's been a literacy coach and reading specialist. So she's coming to us with that thick knowledge. She's worked with students, kindergarten through grade eight, and now in higher education. She has her administrative licenses as a principal or director of instruction, and superintendent, and she set those aside to work with adult learners here at UJAC. We do love our students. She's passionate about helping future teachers develop the needed skills to be successful as a professional in the field of education. And we are so excited to have her here with us. Um, let's do a little quick mic check. Dr. Simisek, are you able to speak? Let's see if we can hear you. Dr. Shipley, can you please unmute Dr. Simisek? There we go. Okay, I'm unmuted. I cannot um, come on the video screen. Okay, Dr. Shipley will you allow me to do that. Yeah. see we can see your presentation and hear you very well so okay great yeah why don't we roll with it as is um and i again am just very honored and excited to have you here and hear you speak dr simisek the floor is yours thank you so much um, for the wonderful introduction i do appreciate that so as i was introduced my name is michelle simisek i'm super happy to be here with you guys today I really believe that this conference that my wonderful colleagues put together each year is one of the best learning opportunities out there for educators. We are touching people from all over the country and even the world I'm seeing through, this presen through these pre presentations, and I'm honored to be a presenter this year. Um, I feel like I got a pretty good introduction. I've got 20 years in education. Um, some of the ideas that I'm going to share with you today come from what I learned very long ago when I started my career under a very strong leader out in Colorado. So we're going to be talking about positive discipline and how to use this approach to manage behaviors in the classroom. We're going to start off with a very brief overview of what positive discipline means. So for those of us working with young children, we know that they all have good days and bad days, and we need to have some structures in place to encourage the behavior we desire in the learning environment. With positive discipline, we want children to learn how to behave through guidance and modeling. In other words, in a positive discipline environment, you're not yelling, shaming, or doling out consequences. You're responding to the children, not reacting. It's about establishing and maintaining limits with children. We want our children to learn to be responsible, respectful, and resourceful. When it's all said and done, all children should be contributing members of their communities, starting with the learning community in which they're currently in. Positive discipline really does have the power to change lives. It can be used in the family home as well as in the classroom. Learning to work with the children to guide behaviors has many long-term benefits. So how can we establish effective discipline? There are five criteria. Dr. Maurice Elias from Rutgers University, he's a co-author of the Academy for Social Emotional Learning in Schools, has done quite a bit of research on what helps children feel successful. In that research, they found 28 categories that affect learning, but eight of the top 11 involve social emotional learning, teacher interaction, classroom climate, and involvement with peers. So the message is that the classroom environment and those relationships with not only teachers, but also their peers is extremely important. This is what gives children a sense of belonging. One of the best things I learned as a new teacher from that tremendous leader I mentioned 
was to invest three to four weeks at the beginning of the school year just to build that sense of community. Her philosophy back then, one that I soon adopted, was that the teaching and learning will happen much easier once the children feel that they are part of the classroom community. We were not even allowed to start true content the first three weeks of the school year. This is a practice I took with me to my following districts in the Midwest, but the belief here was generally to get started earlier in content. I got a little bit of pushback and some eye raising from my coworkers when I didn't start my content right away. I held off. What ended up happening was by the holidays, I was caught up to the other teachers who started content immediately and generally passed them up because my classroom was running smoothly. I didn't have to stop regularly to manage behaviors. We had structures in place which led to a well-run classroom with few interruptions. If you can get to the social emotional in children, you can get to the academics. Our classrooms, it needs to offer children a sense of connection. We heard that in the last presentation. Is your classroom respectful? Is it kind and firm at the same time? Is it short-term only or is it effective long-term? We wanna create habits and behaviors that are positive going forward, not just for today, but for the long haul. Does it teach life skills that are important for the greater good? Does it invite children to discover what they are capable of? Dr. Alias says that you really need to have an umbrella over your school's goals and curriculum, which deals with that very important social emotional piece, or you don't have anything that guides you with your work with students. He states that our social emotional learning and character development should guide the instruction. This is important when thinking about our classrooms and even the school structure. So many of you have probably heard of PBIS for Positive Behavior Intervention S Supports. This is somewhat related. However, PBIS has changed over time. So some models encourage rewards. In positive discipline, we're looking more at intrinsic rewards and there is a big difference there. We want students to feel good inside about behaving and being part of the community. We don't wanna just reward good behavior because that's not real life. I really have seen that just making this the norm and the expectation and how one fits in with the community will lead to better results. Do I reward students? I still do, but generally we work on those reward ideas as a classroom community and they work towards those rewards together. The principles presented today come from the book titled Positive Discipline in the Classroom. It's by Jane Nelson, <clears throat> and I will have a link later on also to her website. She also wrote the book Positive Discipline, which offers additional strategies for parents at home to use as well. So the principles of her book come from Adlerian principles. Okay, these are based on a psychiatrist from the late 1800s. Alfred Adler was based in Austria and his work focused on the goals and purposes of human behavior. Positive discipline is based on this theory that humans are social beings. We all want to belong. All of our behavior is socially embedded and has meaning behind it. Our primary goal in life is that we want to feel a sense of belonging. We as humans are all looking for something. Our behavior is goal oriented. And our primary goal is to feel a sense of belonging. That may be in a classroom, a family, a group, at church, in scouts, a club, a sport, anywhere that we can contribute and find meeting. But he also stated that we have to have a feeling of belonging there and significance. I need to feel valued for what I can contribute to my group. I also need to have friends and have friends and peers who value me. Adler said that a misbehaving child is a discouraged child. He said that as kids are moving toward that belonging and significance that they so badly need, if they can't find it, they will act out inappropriately. They then end up doing things to try to get noticed. I'm sure you can think of some students in your classrooms. Think of the silly kid, the class clown, the one who yells or acts up or throws a tantrum. This is to get people to look at them. 
then they feel like they made a contribution. In reality, does that make them part of the group? No, and it will usually backfire, but it's an example. And we call those mistaken goals. At the end of the presentation, we're gonna look a little bit closer at mistaken goals on a handout that I'll provide and review those a little bit more in depth. Adler was also big into social interest. So I care so much about you, I would do almost more for you than I would do for myself. I'm so appreciative of what my family did for me, I want to do for other families. Our learning environments need to demonstrate dignity and respect for all. All members are valued and appreciated. We also wanna make sure that we model for our children that mistakes are wonderful opportunities to learn. When we make mistakes, we want to model how we learn from those. Do some think alouds with your students. Whoops, I messed that up. I should have done A, B, C, D. Talk out your thinking to get through those. These are great opportunities for children to learn from you. So when you make a mistake, don't get angry about it. Turn it into a learning opportunity. Our classrooms need to have that message of love. It always needs to come through. That connection between all of us is important. We want to lead with love with the children we work with. All of us working in education, we didn't choose this path to make us rich, did we? Because we wanted to make a difference in the lives of children. We want to remind ourselves of this daily and always lead with love. Even when we're frustrated and tired and had late nights and parent-teacher conferences and you show up tired and your child's misbehaving in the class, pause and remember, they're always learning from us, from our expressions, from our faces, from how we treat them. So again, all the work in this, in this book are principles of Alfred Adler. So you can look him up if you're interested in his research. On this slide, you're gonna see a triangle of behaviors. And I'm sure many of you in, especially if you're in public schools, you've seen something like this before. Um, it's similar to a response to intervention or positive behavior intervention supports, PBIS. But the tip of the triangle where you see that level four, and it says three to five students, this is really just a tiny bit of your students but their behaviors are serious, they are chronic and, just, and they are disruptive and it can feel like a whole lot more than three to 5%. But let's start at the base of the triangle. So you have level one and level two and they really are the majority of your students. Level one, those are your well-behaved students. They're generally following your rules. Level two, you may see some very low level misbehaviors, some talking, some slight misbehavior, and then we look at level three, which is smaller. That's still only seven to 10% of our students, but these students are the ones that kind of keep you up at night. They're the ones everybody knows. They misbehave more regularly. Then that top number is those serious chronic problems. Those are the ones that generally get sent out of the room or have a specialist or a behavior referral going on. When we talk about interventions for students, Positive discipline will change what happens in the lowest two sections very easily. It does then begin to affect level three. And over time, with consistency, you will see it hit level four. The more you are consistent with positive discipline, the more of your students you will affect with this approach. You'll see better results if you get buy-in from your whole school or center, because these principles can be built on over time. So if you use it with your youngest classrooms, by the time they move up a grade or two, you get more results. This approach, if done with consistency, works really well for all students. Like I said, if a whole school takes this approach, it takes about three to five years for it to be fully implemented into a school. When I first taught in Colorado early in my career, Positive discipline, although we didn't call it that, but that, that was what we were using. It was the norm at the school under the leader I worked with. Part of why it was so successful was that the entire school was doing it and we were committed. It was also adopted the year before I joined. So I was able to see how it looked after one, two, and three years. By year three, our students were so well-behaved since it was the expe expectation and the norm. 
And I'll tell you, it was a big district. We had over 30 um, elementary schools and the substitutes always chose our school if they were asked to sub. They loved coming because they always said they knew what to expect no matter which classroom they were placed in. They could kind of expect similar expectations. So now some schools change over time to positive discipline. Maybe they have something else in place. So they'll start by leaving their old system in place and adding components of positive discipline. And then you will find that you need to rely on your previous models less and less. So many of us went to work back when assertive discipline was the norm. So do you remember that names on the chalkboard for the naughty kids? Assertive discipline is structured systematic approach to assist teachers in running organized classes where the teacher is in charge. So back for those of us growing up in the 70s and the 80s, we know this. It was authoritarian. It really has evolved a little bit more to moving in the, in the direction of democratic and cooperative now, um, but at the time it was very authoritative. Lee and Marlene Cantor developed this system throughout their work consulting for school, dist school districts. It was originally an assertive discipline and tangible awards, but they even moved over now to, they're saying they don't agree with putting the names on the board. So they're not doing so much of the negative, um, but this model will still have some type of negative consequences for negative behavior, whereas positive discipline is 100% focused on the positive. The belief in assertive discipline is that it is the teacher's classroom. The teacher should decide the rules. So the difference here between this and positive discipline is that in positive discipline, the community of learners works together to come up with the norms and the acknowledgements. One of the main components of having positive discipline in place, and one of the most important things to do is to ensure you have classroom jobs. You really need to make sure there are enough jobs in your room so that everyone is involved. And if possible, everyone has a job. Work with your students to come up with some of these jobs. <clears throat> Remember, we want to involve the students in deciding how this community works as much as possible. For very young children, you can guide this conversation, but they are still more than able to help you. This works on that feeling of belonging and significance. And remember, those two things are key in positive discipline. I know sometimes you might think when you're working in early childhood that you can't expect much out of very young children, and I'd like to disagree. I visited a four-year-old Montessori classroom in Wisconsin a few years ago when I was doing some observations. And I approached the door and a young boy walked up to greet me right away. He was extremely polite and well-spoken and he said, hello, my name is Brady. Welcome to our classroom, can I help you? He was four. This child was the classroom greeter. That was his job. But think about that, the wonderful skills he was learning in that job of greeter. This is something you could share between two students to have two people have the job, but you want to make sure that everybody is involved. You can change your jobs every couple of weeks. This way, everyone has a way to contribute. Sometimes you might have multiple students share jobs. Maybe not every day does every student have a job but they should have regular jobs and feel invested in those. If you're teaching older students like high school, I'm not sure if anybody out there is, but obviously there would be less jobs, but you still figure out a rotating system where every student has a way to contribute to the community. Along with classroom jobs, modeling is extremely important component of positive discipline. So I was gonna ask you to do an activity with me but I need to come on screen and I'm not sure um, if Tisha or Stephanie, were you able to figure out my video so that I could come on screen? Michelle, it won't let me, but it's not saying that you can't start your video. There you go. Okay, perfect. It wasn't allowing me earlier. So I'm gonna ask all of you or whoever's watching, if you're comfortable, to come on screen because we're gonna do a modeling activity together and it would be easier if I can see you. So I'm gonna stop sharing for just a minute. We're gonna experiment with this. And let me see if I can see any of you guys.
I don't know that any of the well. right come on screen. Okay. But I am for sure here. Okay. Well, we'll you guys can all watch Tisha then because she's going to do this with me. Um, but if you're at home, I want you to try this because this is, shows you the power of modeling. So we're going to take a minute and now you're off screen now, Tisha, I can't see you. And they're saying they can't use the video. Right. Oh, stop, stop. Okay. So you're going to sit up really straight. So everybody sit up really straight and put your feet flat on the floor. Okay. And I want you to roll your shoulders back and kind of down and put your hands on your knees. And I want you to make a circle with your right hand. So you're making a circle with your right hand. And I want you to put it on your chin. So if you're watching me and you're doing that, probably three quarters of you just put your hand on your cheek because I said, I want you to put your circle on your chin, but I put mine on my cheek. So why did that happen? What does that tell you about how we learn through modeling? Okay, it's so important that we're modeling all of these things that we hope to see from our children. The process is not always modeled in the kids' homes. So we heard that with the last presenter. P parents are often, oh, hang on, let me share my screen again. I just realized I cut you off. Okay. So parents are often not modeling for their, for their children. And parents can be quick to blame, to punish, and to guilt. They don't always do that, take the time and model appropriate behavior. So we wanna make sure we are doing that for students. As teachers, we have this opportunity to model how to handle mistakes. So when you make mistakes, remember when I said it was such a great opportunity for learning, we can model how to ask for forgiveness. When we blow up or say something we shouldn't have or wish we hadn't, we can model for that child how to handle it. Modeling is the second practice in positive discipline. So remember we did jobs, that was number one. Modeling is number two. Kids model and mirror what they see in us, especially when children are very young. Those of you working with young children especially have this opportunity to model all day long. For those of you who are parents, Think back to those days with your two to three month old child. You looked in their faces and smiled and they cooed because they were mirroring you. They were reacting from your expressions. Oops, hang on. My slides are going a little too fast here. There we go. Okay, so if you are so inclined, I want you to look into mirror neurons. Oh, hang on. It's like a delayed reaction when I'm clicking ahead. Sorry about that. So there is some great research out there about mirroring neurons. So there is this research with monkeys on this and they had wires attached to the monkey's brains. And the researchers were studying what when the monkey's brains lit up, like when they ate peanuts or a banana, and they would get excited. So on the imaging screen, they could tell that the monkeys were excited because their brain was showing that activity. However, one day a researcher came in and ate a peanut. And while the monkey was sitting there watching, his neurons lit up during the activity, just in the same way that they lit up when he was eating himself. So scientists came up with this term mirror neurons. This was the start of studying what happens during that mirroring process. Eventually, similar studies have been done with humans, and the research continues today around these mirroring neurons. So again, when you think back to holding that little baby in your arms and you're looking into their eyes, you aren't just sitting there with a flat face. You don't have a still face. You are making faces with that baby, and that baby is reacting to you. Your face is always giving little reactions that your baby is learning at from the expressions from a very young age. There's a section in the Positive Discipline book about self-regulation. And in that section, there's a website reference for mirror neurons and how that part of the brain functions. It's great, it has some great activities for older students. So if you do work with older students, I suggest you look that up. If you do end up purchasing or checking out this book from your library, 
there is a reference to mirror neurons and some of the activities that you can do with children related to this idea. Otherwise, feel free to look up this topic because there is some interesting blogs out there and research articles online. Okay, so now we're gonna do a brainstorm. And I want to, I'm gonna get my chat open because I wanna be able to see the chat. And this is where we're going to do this. I want you all to type in the chat some of the problematic behaviors you all see in your classrooms. So think of a couple of behaviors that are problematic, disruptive to your day that you see happening in the classrooms and type it in the chat. So I see touching each other, bullying, yelling out, talking nonstop, screaming and hitting, throwing toys. And let me see if there's any others coming in, bringing objects from home and playing with them. Interrupting, yep. On the next slide, I've got a list of the ones that typically come up when we talk about this. And some of those will be the same as what you are all saying. Misbehavior talking is a big one. Lack of mutual respect, being off task, profanity, especially for those of you working with older students, challenging of authority, um, entitlement, overuse of technology, being sassy, loud, apathetic, negative. Um, Cyberbullying is becoming problematic, especially with older children, especially with online learning. Um, and then oppositionally defiant, um, we see some of that. So just keep those problematic behaviors in mind as we go forward. Now think about the students that you work with right now. You're all working with different ages. Set aside the problems that you see. But imagine that they come back to visit you in 20, 25 years. They're adults now. What are some of the qualities you would hope to see in those students? What are you hoping to instill into your students? Based on what you did in the classroom, So if you can use the chat here again and share some of the things that you hope you're gonna see in your students when they visit you 15, 20 years later, what are the most important characteristics that we are working towards? I'm seeing empathy, respect, compassion for learning. Um, I know some will say having good manners, being responsible, a respect for each other, consideration. I'm seeing happy and happy and healthy, a love of learning, critical thinking. Yeah, critical thinkers. We want to create critical thinkers. Um, hopefully, they're morally grounded, team players, kind, culturally aware, respect and loyalty. Yes. Um, hopefully they have communication skills. You know, they're growing up using their technology. We need to teach and model how to use communication skills. I want you guys to think for a second about self-esteem. Where does self-esteem come from? They've been praised. Someone said, you're good at that. But self-esteem comes from within, from figuring out you can do something. It's how you feel about yourself. When you know you can handle something and you can go into a situation and come out successfully. This discovery in ourselves shows us that we can handle things. And this is what gives us self-esteem. So we need to help our children have experiences that offer them the opportunity to accomplish something so that we can get them to have that feeling. This is why we have jobs. This is why we need to give them roles in the classroom so they can learn that they are capable. It is crucial down the road as they're developing. Remember, we have them for seven or eight hours a day. Chances are some of them go home and they don't have those models. So what can we give them when they're with us? This is just a wordle that I put together um, with some of those characteristics that we're gonna hope to see in our future students. If you've been teaching as long as some of us have, 
Um, I can tell you that I am blessed to have students get in contact with me over social media. I have run into students um, on vacation. You know, I'll find out that they're somewhere and we'll run into each other. And I couldn't be more proud of the humans that they're becoming. And I do believe some of that came back from how we raise them in the classrooms. So some of the characteristics that we listed are here. You can see responsible. That comes up a lot. So it's showing up. It's very prevalent. Same with discipline and being self-aware. We are all working toward the same goal with the students we work with. We really need to keep in mind that end goal and how we get there. So teachers use different times of the day for class meetings, but class meetings are an important part of positive discipline. You can do these during your circle time or perhaps first thing in the morning or at the end of the day meetings. Positive discipline meetings are designed to be student generated and to focus on solutions. So students who put their concerns on an agenda and then everyone brainstorms for solutions. So doing this allows our students to learn from the inside out by being involved. I used to have a daily agenda for our meetings. So I had an easel in my classroom and every morning I had a message for my students and I had a sign up. So children would walk in and they could sign up for different things. So they could sign up if they had a book to share. Um, they could sign up if something important happened that they wanted to share. Um, but the important thing was that they did need to sign up ahead of time. So this gave the children an opportunity to think ahead. Um, if there had been an issue during the day, like we had, we talked about if there was a behavior issue or they got into an argument, they could sign up to have that resolved in the meeting. Um, the reason for the sign up was to make sure the meeting did not get taken over by too many stories. So if they forgot to sign up and then all of a sudden they remembered something, I would just remind them they could sign up the next day. And generally each day, a couple of kids would sign up. And if I noticed something concerning me that happened during the school day, I would also sign up an issue and then the children and I would work to find out solutions. I started this practice when I was teaching in second grade and that was the first grade that I taught. But then I moved to kindergarten and my principal didn't think that kindergartners would be able to handle this kind of meeting. I insisted they could. And I did end up proving him wrong because after about three weeks, when I remember I spent the first three weeks setting up that community, I had my kindergartners trained to be able to get through a meeting. Of course, I had to lead it a lot in the beginning of the year, but my students were just as able to walk in and sign up. Remember those jobs? I always had a student meeting helper. This was one of the jobs. Sometimes I had two students, two meeting helpers. Eventually, after enough modeling, my students completely ran the meetings by themselves without me, even in kindergarten. So I do have a video. I'm going to show a little bit of it here, and it shows you what a positive discipline um, meeting would look like. So I'm just going to drag it over. And can you see that on the screen, Tisha? Yes. I just want to make sure you're seeing it. Okay, perfect. and appreciations. If you don't have one, you just pass. Thank you. And then we will um, come back and we'll try and solve the problem that's in our agenda today. Everybody cool? Okay. Um, let's see. I would like to compliment um, Calvin and Felicia because today during Reader's Workshop, at first they both really wanted to sit on the chair and they were kind of like talking about who was going to be there and then they solved that problem pretty well. So I'd like to compliment you for that. I would like to compliment Allison um, and Shin Chen because um, they went to meet with the library. They the same thing. Speak a little louder. Um, I like to compliment Samara and Felicia. 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 Oh, for what? Can you tell us a little more? Um, 
Put the pumps. Okay. nicely that round went. Okay, we haven't done this before. This is our first time that someone has written a problem in the agenda. So I want to describe to you what that process looks like for solving a problem. So what will happen is I'll read the problem today and we um, will go around the room. If the person who wrote it wants to say more and explain it, then they can and they should because then it'll give us some background information for the problem. And um, then we can pass the turtle, the talking turtle around, and if you have um, a suggestion for a way they could solve that problem, then that would be really helpful. Does that make sense? Okay, so I'm gonna, did, is that how you did it in first grade? Okay, so it says, today, Ion and Zewin were provoking me. What provoking? Um, would the person who wrote this like to say a little bit more? Okay. Can you tell us a little bit more about the problem? What do you, because I heard a classmate say they're not sure what the word provoking means. Can you explain what that means? Provoking means like if somebody's like, somebody's like bothering you and stuff. Like it's like if somebody took something from you and then you keep on whining for it, that's, what, that's provoking. Okay. So um, it's kind of like somebody's bothering you and you know like if somebody like if keeps... Like, so, like if you had a pen and somebody took it from you. Yeah, and they keep doing it over and over and it's provoking you. It's making you feel like you want to get angry or you, you don't like it. Okay? Um, I'll take it back. Thank you for saying that. Kevin, do you have a possible suggestion? No, it's something about. Okay. Sometimes when people provoke, um, they mean to do, like they mean to take something away. Mm -hmm. So then, because they want to see the person be mad. Okay, so that might be a reason for the behavior. We've talked a little bit about reasons for behavior, right? We've said that sometimes if somebody is bossing or provoking, it might mean that they're hurt in some way. Um, so, anybody have a suggestion for a solution for Lolly at the moment? So tell Lolly, okay? You well, know, maybe you can like uh, tell them that they're bothering you and then them to stop. Thank you. I'm just going to stop it there because I think we're getting um, an, idea. Okay. Your hand is an idea on what this meeting could look like um, in our classrooms. Um, and you notice that they had the talking turtle, but think about that great modeling that is going on with that teacher and her students to go through problems. And I have a feeling that you'll agree with me that not many families are sitting down to dinner to work through problems that occur. So our children are not really learning how they can solve problems. And through a circle activity like this, where they're brainstorming ideas together, they're taking those on as they continue to grow. So it's just such a powerful idea. And like I said, sometimes the students aren't going to throw something on that agenda but as a teacher, you see things or problems that happen throughout the day, and you can throw it on the agenda to kind of get that ball rolling. Okay, so I have four squares here on this slide. Um, when we look at behaviors associated with kindness versus firmness, we're gonna see some interesting things, okay? In the upper left-hand corner, you see characteristics of a child who grows up surrounded by kindness, but without that firmness. So what do you see? A selfish child, kind of no boundaries, they're spoiled, maybe entitled. They can also be bullies if that has been modeled for them at home as well. If we came up for a word with a word for a teacher or a parent who has too much kindness, but not enough fairness, we might call them permissive or indulgent. 
if we wanted to call the firmness, you might call it authoritarian or controlling household. So if you look at the lower right-hand corner, this is gonna be your polar opposite. So these children are growing up with a lot of firmness, but no kindness. You would then see children who might be anxious, stifled, rigid, critical, fear, fearful, cautious. Sometimes they can be defiant and bullies as well. Now, if you have a, two parents and one from each category, you might think that would be a balance, but generally kids will learn to work one parent against the other. So you've heard that aligned parenting works better. Um, parents really do need to work together when it comes to discipline. So what about the kids that get neither kindness or firmness? Now we're in the bottle, bottom left-hand corner. So that ends up looking like neglect. And positive discipline is up in the upper right. This is when we bring together kindness and firmness. We're looking at connection before correction. We're showing respect for feelings and the needs of the child. Connection is important and firmness is the correction. So taking into account the feelings of the child, the correction shows respect for us, and for other classmates. We can't allow kids to walk all over us, of course. We need to correct. That is the firmness piece, but that comes after the connection. So if you connect first, show some empathy. Kids are much more willing to go along with what you want. Make sure when you notice something going wrong with the child that you take a moment to try to understand the child first. Children will be much more willing to listen to you. There's always a reason. There's stuff behind what every child does. So if you think about a child who ends up getting sent to the principal and the principal, instead of just yelling at the child says, you know what, that doesn't really sound like you. What's going on? This is trying to connect with a child. There's a book called Switch. It's by Heath and Heath. And if you're interested in organizational change, it's a good one. But he uses a metaphor in the book of an elephant and a rider. Now there's a path in the, a path in the jungle. And there's a great big well-trained elephant who needs to go down this path. The rider has worked with this elephant for years and years. So they're riding together and they come up to a fork in the path. You could go left and you could go right. Left is where they get where they need to go. But to the right, the elephant can see a pond and there's lovely water. And he says his favorite lady elephant over there who he wants to flirt with. So where is the elephant going to go? He's going to go to the right. He's bigger and more powerful than the rider. So think of the elephant as the emotion, the heart of the matter the feeling about the situation. The writer is the rational thought. If someone comes in and tells me the rational reason I should do something, I'm not likely to hear them. But if they come in and talk to me about my feelings and acknowledge where I'm coming from, I'm much more likely to hear them. So talk to the elephant first. We need to show empathy, but we also need to, to find out where we need to be firm. Um, somebody in the chat is asking where um, I'll put, I'll try to put the link for it. I didn't actually look that one up, um, but I will try to get the link when we get at the end of the presentation. Um, it is by Heath though, isn't it? Okay, this next part, we're gonna do a little case study. I have a PDF file that I'm gonna put into the chat. I did put it in there earlier, but this will be for your reference. This is so you can have a copy of it. Um, so this is a scenario that you see on your slide. There's a four-year-old boy, he's crying loudly. <clears throat> Anytime he does not get his way and he has to take a turn or he has the soccer ball taken from him during a soccer game, okay? So we're gonna be talking about these mistaken goals with children. We want to solve that why behind the behaviors it's so important. Why are they misbehaving? So why is this little boy crying every time he does not get his way or has to take a turn? I'm going to blow up a little piece of this chart that, so I sent you the link. Um, this is going to be the top part in the mistaken goals section. Okay. So if you're looking at the mistaken goals chart, you would see 
that his mistake goal, mistaken goal is undue attention. And his mistaken belief is, I'm only important when I'm keeping you busy with me. Okay, so the coded message that lets me know that this child needs to feel encouraged is notice me, involve me. So I might wanna solve this problem by waiting until the child is calm because then we could have a talk about why and what made him upset. I might say, what do you think might help you feel left out or what, when, what do you think might help you when you feel left out or frustrated and want to cry? Often children are gonna come back and say, I don't know. And that's fine because you can then offer some suggestions. So I might suggest, do you think when you start feeling upset, if we did some nice big deep breaths or started counting to 10, that would help? Okay, child might nod. Well, which one do you think we could try? The child's having a choice. Maybe the child picks deep breaths. Okay, great. So now I need to coach the child. I keep in mind the times when these behaviors tend to show up. And when I notice at beginning, I get into his sight line so I can make a little reminder and I'll try to catch his view and say deep breaths and kind of model it so he can see me. So you have the mistaken goals chart and you can find out more on the positive De behaviors webpage and I'll have that link soon. Um, however, this is a tool that you can use to determine different ways to get at the root of some of the behaviors that you see. I want to wrap up with a little overview of positive discipline. These are some guidelines to consider when setting up a classroom for positive discipline. Number one, use encouragement to help children feel that sense of belonging. So the motivation for misbehaving will be eliminated. Celebrate each step of the direction of improvement rather than focusing on mistakes. A great way to help children feel encouraged is to spend special time with them. Just be with them. Many teachers have noticed a dramatic change in a problematic child after spending five minutes simply sharing what they both like to do for fun. And then we talked about those class meetings. You use those to solve problems with cooperation and mutual respect. This is a key to creating a loving, respectful atmosphere while helping children develop self-discipline, responsibility, cooperation, and problem-solving skills. These can be a start for the day or the end of the day, but find a time to gather as a classroom community. Give children meaningful jobs in the name of expediency. Many parents and teachers do things that children could do for themselves. Children feel belonging when they know they can make a real contribution. So we talked about those examples earlier. Make sure children have jobs so they feel purpose. Decide together what jobs need to be done, put them all in a jar and let each child draw out a few each week. Take time for training. Make sure children understand what clean the kitchen really means to you. To them, it might mean simply putting the dishes in the sink. Parents and teachers may ask, what is your understanding of what is expected? Remember when I mentioned that I would spend three to four weeks teaching routines and building community in the beginning of the year, I would model what was expected at each learning center, how to clean those up. We would practice over and over until I knew that the children understood those expectations. We need to teach and model mutual respect. One way is to be kind and firm at the same time. Kind to show respect, but firm to show respect for yourself and the needs of the situation. This is difficult during conflict, so use um, the next guideline whenever possible, and that is proper timing. Proper timing will improve your effectiveness tenfold. It does not work to deal with a problem at the time of the conflict because emotions get in the way. Teach children about cooling off periods. You or the children can go to a separate room and do something to make yourself feel better and then work on the problem with mutual respect after you've cooled off. Use positive timeouts. Let your children help you designate a pleasant area with cushions, books, music, stuffed animals. This will help them feel better. Remember that children do better when they feel better. Then you can ask your children when they are upset, do you think it would help to go take a positive time out? Beware of punishment. Get rid of the crazy idea that in order to make children do better, first you need to make them feel worse. Do you feel like doing better when you just were humiliated? This suggests a whole new look at timeout. 
punishment may work if all you are interested in is stopping the behavior for the moment. Sometimes we must be aware of what works when the long range results are negative, resentment, rebellion, revenge, or retreat. Teach children that mistakes are wonderful opportunities to learn. We talked about that earlier. Focus on solutions instead of consequences. Many parents and teachers try to disguise punishment by calling it a logical consequence. Get children involved in finding solutions that are related, respectable, reasonable, and helpful. Make sure that message of love and respect always gets through. Start with, I care about you. I'm concerned about you. I'm concerned about this situation. Will you work with me to help me find a solution? And finally, have fun. We need to bring joy into the classrooms. Always remember, we want children to love being at school and with us. We cannot guarantee that they go home to enjoyable circumstances. Many children live in chaos. We want to ensure that when they come to school, it is a safe and fun environment for them where they feel respected. Okay, so positive discipline. I just wanna wrap up with um, some of the research that's out there. This has been in use for several, several years. And they've done some research on the characteristics that are present in children who learn in a classroom that uses positive discipline. Think about how closely this mirrors that list that you all came up with earlier in the chat. So some of the things that they see are positive self-concept, responsibility, self-discipline, cooperation, open-mindedness, objective thinking skills, respect for self and others, compassion, acceptance of self, interest in learning, courtesy, honesty, manners, self-control, patience, concern for others, problem-solving skills. This really is the list you all came up with just a few minutes ago. So the more you study positive discipline, the more you will see that it aligns with the values that we share as educators. So my favorite way to learn new strategies to use with my students are number one, go into others' classrooms. I was lucky to be able to do this a lot during my career. Um, I enjoy going into others' classrooms and taking ideas that I can use in my own. However, I know with COVID, visiting classrooms is tough. Um, so my second way is attending conferences like this. We can all learn from each other. So if you could all close out by just taking a minute to write in something that you already do in your class that aligns with what we spoke about here today that you think others may consider trying. And so you're gonna focus your attention into the chat, um, share some ideas as we close out. If you're not sure how to get into the chat on the bottom of your screen, you should see three dots and it says more. And if you click on that, you can select chat. So you can be a part of the chat that works on your phone as well. Um, so share an idea or two that you use, um, take some ideas for others. It's such a great way to learn. And I will be sharing my email. Um, and then you see the link for the Positive Discipline website where they also have some great tools for you and some videos. Um, so if you have any thoughts or questions, please feel free to email me. Um, continue sharing your ideas in the chat. And I really thank you for having me. I enjoyed presenting this year and hope that you leave with some ideas to start your classroom um, in a great way um, and encourage that positive discipline. Michelle, thank you so much. Um, people in the chat were asking about this, and I think you gave some really great suggestions, loved your videos. Um, I think that there's a lot of people talking in the chat right now. Um, if you have questions, comments, concerns, you can go ahead and ask Michelle. We're going to go ahead and put the participation certificate in the um, chat box and up on the screen. Make sure you take a picture of Michelle's information. Um, and Michelle, you can also put your uh, your email in the chat box. Okay, I will do that and I'll stay on chat for a while in case anybody has questions while we get going on the next one. Yes, that is completely fine. Lauren, I'm gonna go ahead and make you co-host and whenever um, Dr. Heald gets the um, certificate down, you can go ahead and upload. Thank you, Michelle, you did amazing. Thank you, Tisha.